be forgiven them. I want you to think about that for a minute. What does that have to do with, 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 with light quantum, Pastor? Um, I know, and I thank God for this, I know what it is Einstein was trying to know or trying to come to understand this light. He, had, he did identify it as light, and he's absolutely right. It is light. But it's not the kind of light you necessarily see. John chapter 8 and 12 says this. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. What a simple statement. But what a profound statement. If Einstein could have really took the time to listen to Jesus, it would have blew his mind. It would have rocked the world. From a scientific perspective, to hear Jesus say, I am the light of the world, Einstein would have said, what? Hold on a minute. You're the what? And if he had took him serious, Einstein's mind would have been opened up into some things that would have been absolutely phenomenal. But Einstein continued to deal with what was tangible. Actually, I mean, let me back up. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But listen to this. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. First John chapter 1 and 5. This then is a message which I have heard of them and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light. Here is this word light coming from Jesus or coming about Jesus and coming about God. God is Jesus, but it, it, it's telling you whether you're Jew or whether you're Christian. God is light. There is a light in him that men don't understand. Men don't perceive. I want to, Isaac, if you would just throw that slide up there really quick. Brown in motion, I'm going to read you a direct paragraph from the book. And I want you to tell me how this sounds to you. But this idea of brown in motion. Uh, go ahead and play it while I read it if it stops looping again. But listen to this. This is a directly quote out of the book. Eleven days after finishing his dissertation, Einstein produced another paper exploring, listen to this, the evidence of things unseen. That's the title of his paper. But he's not looking at, at Jesus. Einstein, or faith, Einstein is looking for things and trying to prove that things exist that we can't see. That's how this whole idea of molecular science starts, because he theorizes that something's going on that we can't see with our human eyes, but in the world at that time, that's ridiculous. If you can't see it, it's not real. But Einstein was one of the first to get out there and say, just because I don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm going to go a little deeper. Doesn't that sound like some Christians you know? Doesn't that sound like faith? So he goes on to say this, evidence, he writes a paper exploring the evidence of things unseen. And as he had been doing since 1901, he replied, he relied on statistical analysis um, of the random actions of invisible particles to, to show how they were reflected in the visible world. And, and that's another thing. There's two kinds of light. I can go outside and I can see the light of the sun shining off of your car, shining off of this church, shining off of the green grass. And I'm not seeing the grass itself. What I'm seeing with my natural eyes is a reflection of the sunlight hitting the grass. I'm not seeing the grass. Because, it, you know, I may even be able to feel it, smell it, see it, but there's still an aspect about that grass that yet I haven't connected it. Because I'm not seeing the grass in the true light that heaven formed it in. I'm seeing it with, with the tools that I'm, more, I'm comfortable operating in. But there's an aspect about that grass. There's an aspect about your car. There's an aspect about about this morning. So if any of you have seen The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, they see things about people through that nature, that, 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 that code that is different. And there is something about everything that exists. That's very different than what your natural eye sees. But what you're seeing is the sunlight bouncing off and reflecting off of things, and that's what you're actually seeing. Think about this. Why can't we see spirits? Why can't you see that demon that's sitting right on the couch next to you? I heard someone tell me one time that their baby was standing in the front of the house, uh, in front of the TV, and always was standing and, and look over the shoulder of the mom. And or not always, but there were a few times that it happened, and, and she finally asked, what are you looking at? And the baby said, that man that's always standing behind you, that man right there. And it freaked this lady out. Oh, my goodness, what are you talking about, Jesus? <laughs> but can you imagine somebody saying that to you? But this child discerned and saw something that, that the mother had. And don't tell me demons and spirits don't exist. It's how you see them. It's how you're able to see them. If you're looking for them with these, you'll never see them. You'll feel the effects of them your whole life, but you'll never see them. 
There's a difference between the S-U-N light and the S-O-N light. If you see things through Christ, through the light of heaven, through God and His glory, that light, you will see the spiritual realm. You'll see heaven open above you. You'll see the provision coming to your house every single day. You'll see the angels guarding your property on every side. And if you're walking in that light, you're going to be walking in the confidence that most other people don't. Yeah. Well, who was it, Elijah, where he asked to open his eyes so that he can see that we're not alone? And when the eyes were open, there were legions of angels standing ready for that. If you want to see spiritual things, you've got to see with a different type of light. You can't see with the S-U-N light. You gotta see what the S O N like. Yeah. So we have these ideas, we have these concepts of that, um, and spirits are seen with in S U N S O N light. Does the pit exist? If if I'm in a totally totally dark, there's no sun, no light, there's absolutely nothing. They even say I'm blind, but I mean there's just no light reflecting off of anything. And I'm walking down, I'm just walking down wherever I'm walking, and there's a pit directly in front of me. Does that pit exist yeah. if I don't see it? Yeah. Now, in one way it does exist. But to the person himself that's walking that has no idea that it's there, does it exist to him? No. 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 He would not be able to define it. He's not going to be able to go around it because he doesn't even know it's there to distract him or disrupt him on his journey. But it exists under certain light. But under the person that doesn't see it, it doesn't exist. That's where so many people fall. And they fall and they fall because they don't see N neither does it even exist. No, the reality is it does. I want to say this in that same breath. Your provision exists just like that pit exists that you can't see. Yes, the house that you need paid for so you can have some freedom of life, it exists. It's sitting right next to you. You just don't discern it. Your blessing, your children's deliverance is right there. It exists. You just aren't seeing it. And until you're able to see it, it's not going to materialize. It takes faith to see it. The evidence of things not seen. You've got to be able to hope and have proof that something's going to happen without having to see it. That's what pleases God. That's what the scripture teaches us. That's what excites God. I'm going to keep reading. In doing so, Einstein explained a phenomenon known as Brownian motion that had been puzzling scientists for almost 80 years. Why small particles suspended in liquids such as water are observed to jiggle around. And as a byproduct, he, he pretty much settled once and for all that atoms and molecules actually existed as physical objects. Okay, he proved it. Uh, unseen uh, is now become inconsequential. Just because you don't see something, scientists were willing to say that doesn't mean they don't exist. This is a huge step. But understand, it's not a step in faith towards God. It's a step even deeper into a place they will never ever solve. In other words, God invited them into this realm of unseen things. Scientists are there just like we're there. They believe in things that the Hubble telescope hasn't even shot yet, but they've already got theories and believe in everything in them that things exist up there. They have that much faith. But understand, their faith is going in a different direction than our faith is going. Everything that's unseen, we know it's, it's available to us through God. But anyway... Um, when we speak of light and the speed of light, we mean all electromagnetic waves, not just the ones that are visible to our eyes. Light waves are the disturbance of an unseen medium. When I talk about medium, it's what light travels on, which is called the ether. This is what Einstein identified it as, the ether. And I identify the ether as the glory of God. And I'll, I'll show that in a second. And what their speed is relative to, to this ether. In other words, the ether was, for light waves, something akin to what air is to sound waves. So sound waves travel on air. It takes a while to, for it to get to you. Uh, light waves travel, as, well, as Einstein term goes, on this ether. And that is yet unidentified, what that is. Uh, we know what air is. We breathe it. We've identified what it is. We can't grab it. We really can't touch it or manipulate it, but we know it's there. Everything that human life is built upon is air. If this planet didn't have it, we wouldn't be alive. It's no different. In the spiritual world or the supernatural world or, or in that invisible world, air is, is glory. Is either. This either is glory. And, that, and that, that's a scripture I'll show you right now. Where am I at? It appeared beyond question that light must be interpreted as a vibratory process in an elastic, inert medium filling of universal space. 
There was a great either hunt in 19th century. If flight was indeed the way rippling through the either, then you should, you should see the waves going to you at a faster speed if you were moving through the ether towards the light source. Let me read Isaiah chapter 6 and 3 to you. Scripture says this, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is what? Full of his glory. Is there any place in the existence of mankind in this entire universe that is void of the glory of God? No place. Not even the most frightening places for human beings. Say the bottom of the, the lowest point of the ocean. Or I don't know if man has even traveled there yet. I don't know yet. Or the, the furthest edge of our solar system, where man I know hasn't traveled yet, as cold, as unknown, and as scary as it is out there, is there any place in the universe that's void of the glory of God? To the Christians, no. The scripture tells us the whole earth, in other words, not just the earth, but the entire universe we know is full of his glory. If anyone would say there was a place that was void of God's glory, and it was the cross. It was on Golgotha's hill where Jesus was hung that didn't have glory. But I want you to rewind that a minute and think about it. Was Golgotha really without glory? Or was that the point at which the greatest glory of heaven was revealed? Even the worst thing in human history for us to kill that innocent man, Jesus Christ, which definitely, there was no glory, it was a curse. Yet, it was the point of the greatest glory that heaven would reveal in the earth or the universe. That's why I said, when your trouble comes, don't look at it as trouble. Celebrate it and understand this may be the point of more glory than you've ever been exposed to in your entire life. There is no place on earth that's, de that's void of God's glory. It exists everywhere. And His light shines and travels on that glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. That sounds like theory. I could get into theory of relativity with that scripture. Even as the Spirit of the Lord, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Listen to this, 1 Peter 4.13. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, His glory is going to be revealed to every scientist, to every man on planet earth, his glory is going to be seen. But when his glory is revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Because his glory is already working on you. He's shaping and forming you based on that glory. So according, accordingly, God conceived and he spoke into existence everything that exists. Everything that is, he spoke it. And he brought what already exists in the spiritual realm into this temporal world by his word. Simply by saying it and believing that what he said will materialize and will happen. You have the same ability. You have the same power. We just, we just, why we don't believe it, I don't know. But he brings what already exists by speaking his word. God's spirit gives inspiration and he gives understanding of what exists into, in, in the spiritual realm. And, and if, you, if you're in contact with that spirit, you're going to get it. There's a scripture in Job chapter 32 and 8 that says this. There is a spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding. The spirit God put in us, it gives us understanding. It's there to grab that inspiration that comes from Almighty God. Amen. That's what it's designed for. Why we don't grab it, I don't know. But that's what it's there for. The Spirit always has existed. It's eternal and it's a source of all revelation. It is where all that, all that understanding that's in God and inspiration that's in God is built. And if your spirit is in touch with it, you can receive it also. So God's Spirit will create a blueprint. And that blueprint is what we call understanding. If you were so blessed to be able to see the plans that God has for you. You may not be ready for them. I'll never forget what Bishop T.D. J. said. If God had showed me 15 years into my future, I'd have lost my mind and ran the other way. He never dreamed he would be where God placed him. 30,000, does he have 30,000 members now? Kind of preaching? Church already paid for, $30 million church, $35 million church, paid for in a matter of years, I'm talking not even a decade, not even five, I don't think. But he said, if God had showed me what he had for me, I would have ran the other way. I've never ever went that route. So sometimes God can't show you the plans or the blueprint. But you better believe that they're wonderful. They're great concerning you. 
your life is going to be greater. I can honestly say that if you walk, you continue to walk in Christ Jesus, your life will be better next year than it is this year. Amen. If it's not, it's because somewhere along the road you lost faith and went a different direction. But if you stay with him and you keep working, your life becomes greater and greater and greater. That's a wonderful hope. Amen. And that's the truth. So, um, with the, the guy who, is, who, who designed the computer, before there ever was a computer, he had the idea that if we could figure out a way to calculate some of these computations quicker, we would be all right. But somebody had to go a little bit further than just the dreaming, just the... The, the, the grabbing of it. But the concepts of, of splitting the atom and the computer system, all these things come from God. Man would have never, the understanding of man would have never happened if God weren't ready to introduce it to man. Man wants to find an age. There's all kinds of creams that tell you, buy my cream off. You put it on your face for three weeks, you will look 30 years younger. Everybody's looking for the fountain of youth. Everybody's looking for that. Somebody told me about a pill. What was that? I think Sean, I was your mom. Told me about a pill that I'm very interested in. <laughs> Actually, no, it's not a pill. She said they give you, they'll give you a shot and you'll lose some weight. And it's funny because when I got back, I saw something about that. They're giving it monkeys are losing weight. Because the shot does something. I don't know what it does. But everybody's looking for all these things. And all this, all this stuff. All this stuff comes from God. It's inspired by God. God, when God is ready to cure cancer, guess what? Cancer is going, the cure for cancer is coming. When God's ready to cure AIDS, and men's imaginations are in touch there, they know it's coming. When God's ready to cure AIDS, it's going to get man will be given it. And that's the difference between the science world and the church world, because the science world says man did it in his understanding. The church world says we acknowledge God, we ask God, and He gave us it. Hallelujah. He gave us a man with an yes. understanding yes. That, with this, with this, that, that gave this, and we needed it. The cure for whatever, the cure for whatever. It's just a, it's just a matter of who you acknowledge in giving this understanding. Does this kind of understanding come from men? Or does this kind of understanding come from God? And inspiration comes from God. Inspiration is a God thing. Imagination is a man thing. Inspiration is God himself speaking into the human spirit. His will. Um, inspiration, these thoughts are God's will looking for human antennas to catch them. Every single day, God gives His word and He gives His will. Are there any dreamers in the church today? Amen. There's nothing wrong with you being a daydreamer. Just don't be a dreamer, be a worker and a dreamer. We have it made. And but some of us have to dream. Let your imagination run wild. When I wrote on that faith, that statement, we say once a month, a thousand, one thousand, that was not easy for me to write on that paper. But by faith, I, I wrote it. And by faith, I believe it. I don't know how it's going to happen. I have no idea. But I believe that we're going to affect a thousand lives for Christ. There'll be a thousand people, amen, affected and brought into relationship with Jesus Christ because of this small ministry. I believe that. I'm not saying I gotta I have to be pastor over a thousand. I just want to plant a thousand seed that will bring a thousand pieces of fruit. That's all I'm looking for. And I believe it's gonna happen. I, I have no doubt about it. Amen. But it's not always easy to, to grab hold of. Jeremiah 29 11, I'm closing up. God's thoughts are good and they're not evil. And I just want to remind you all that, that God is up to something good for, about, for you. He has something good for you in mind. Ephesians chapter 320, above and beyond all that you can ask or imagine, He's got planned for you. Good things God has planned for us. So our lives are built on a series of thoughts. And just like bricks that are used to build a house. Every present thought is, is a significant building block on the kind of life that you're living or your future. If you've been using certain kind of rocks and you put a different, everything you put in there is for you. Your house may look crazy in the end, but understand this. Every thought that you're giving God to work with is a building block upon with the final product. Make sure there's no crooked rocks in there. No cracked blocks. Everything in your life was great, but that's, that was the month, you know, your, your, your honey pie uh, called you that word out of the side of the mouth that just kind of mess things up and you can see this big dent in your house and then you get it all together and everybody's fine but the light keeps going don't even try, don't even let those dents happen but whatever it is God will take care of it but your thoughts are these building blocks these are the bricks so a lot of us are building our lives out of huts and they're building, we're building our lives like shanties and other people are building their lives like mansions what's the difference why are we living in this and they're living in that 
What's the difference? But if our thoughts are inferior, saints of God, your life's going to be inferior. If your thoughts are lofty and they're honorable, you're laying the foundations to live accordingly. Honorable lives. Amen? So all that a man achieves of what he's thinking are a direct result of the faith and the thoughts and the imagination that are happening inside of him. So if your life's going to change, saints, uh, you've got to think for a change. You've got to start thinking for that type of change you're going to be walking in. You've got to start seeing the Grammy. You've got to start seeing yourself hold the Grammy in the mirror. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to have some other people out there. Just start talking in the mirror, holding that Grammy Award. Maybe it's not a Grammy Award. Maybe it's that Publishers Clear has a $10 million check on the phone. I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe it's the fact that you just stay close to God for a whole entire year without acting a fool. Yeah. That's better than his way to go with stuff right there. Yeah. But whatever it is you need, you've got to start seeing it. You've got to start believing it. Amen. you got to do it. But here's the principle saying, you're never going to have more or you're never going to go further or accomplish greater things than your thoughts will allow you to. You forget it. If you don't see yourself graduating college, it's going to be an uphill battle. And more than likely, you're not going to graduate college. If you don't see yourself getting a promotion on your job, you're going to have to act a certain way that doesn't warrant them picking you up. You've got to be able to see. You've got to ask God to inspire you and let your imagination go. He said you will do more than you're able to even think about, dream about. He can do for you. So it's not enough to just meditate on success uh, generally, you need to be specific about it. Saints, we are the architects, we're the builders of our lives. We're the ones um, that are, have con are the contractors for our future. Yes. We pick the number that's coming in. We watch them lay the foundation. We make sure that the GFI scriptures are put in. We're the ones that are, have to watch our lives that closely. Otherwise, when the future arrives, you're going to be living in one of these huts that are across the border. <laughs> I'm not making fun of Mexico. It's just the way that they, they let things be built over there. Without certain codes. You and God, He has a code and He knows the best way to build your quality life. Let Him do that. Amen. Let your thought, use your thoughts like an architect would use a blueprint. And think about every detail. Nothing's too insignificant. Think big, Saints. Think detailed about your life. Think about it. I thought about my marriage before I ever got married. I thought about and prayed about my wife. I can remember specifically 16 year old. 16 year old. 16 years of age, I'm sitting on my roof of my house thinking about the girl. The girl. Not all these girls. The girl. Where's she at? I'm looking at South Mountain. I remember the day I was looking at South Mountain. I was from the south, from the north, from the west. Well, I was feeling it. I was feeling it. And it was the southwest. But I didn't know at that time. But I was praying for her. I was thinking about her. What is she going to look like? How old is she right now? Didn't know she was uh, not even a junior high yet. But uh, what? Where is this girl? And I remember, I can specifically remember praying, Lord, bless her, whoever she is. Because whatever you have for me, make her and me fit to where I'm not going to have a bunch of obstruction in my life. I'm going to be able to be focused in my life. I'll serve you. She'll love you like I love you. And I began to pray for her before I ever got into marriage or even an engagement with her. That's the way you have to be about your life diligent. Let me tell you something quick about Michael Dell. He began selling computer systems and accessories from his dorm room at age 19. But at age 19, he also borrowed $1,000 from a family member. And he launched a multi-million dollar company. And it dominates, at least it did a few years ago, it dominated the entire computer manufacturing firm. Michael Dell, Dell Computers. And it was because, how they do it? Because he thought big. He thought outside the box. He thought detailed thoughts. He said, I can do something that other people don't do. And he capitalized on that inspiration and where his imagination led him. And he had the faith to step out on it. It was $1,000 that he borrowed. And Dell Computers exist today because of this one man not limiting himself to do what he, he imagined he could do. It's amazing what we can do. You gotta think those kinds of thoughts. Mark chapter 10, 27. With God, all things are possible. I'm not not some things, all things are possible. I asked the question in Park, I'm gonna ask the same question here. Is it easier to walk on water 
or to win a Nobel Peace Prize? What's easier to do? Think about it. Is it easier to walk on water or make a million dollars? What's easier to do? Is it easier to walk on water or to win 1,000 souls for Christ? What's easier to do? Because we know walking on water is possible with Jesus Christ. So if anyone will say walking on water is harder than all these other things, doesn't matter if you're with Jesus, because if you have to walk on water, you can walk on water. But it takes faith. You've got to believe that Christ will do anything he needs to do. So nothing, that's, nothing limits your achievement, saints, more than thinking small. Oh, glory. Nothing will expand your imagination more than thinking and allow Christ to take your imagination. So practice, saints, I want you to practice thinking like an entrepreneur. Practice thinking like a college graduate. Practice thinking to be a good father, a good husband. Practice thinking about being a good mother, a good wife. Practice thinking about being the best saint or the greatest woman or man of God you can do, you know. Think about these things. Practice that. And guess what? It will materialize in your life. Begin to see those invisible things. Begin to see those invisible things. And they're going to transpire in your life. They will. Give them time and have the patience. And they're going to happen. So the shame of life is not, uh, is not, is not failing to reach your dream. The shame of life is not having a dream to reach. Always have a goal. Always have a dream out there. So when we plan to change our future, saints, we can't focus on the things, or we can't focus on the people, the circumstances that are smaller than what you're hoping for. Get somehow or another, get these people behind you. I'm married to them. No excuse. Don't disrespect them. Bring them with you. Pray for them. Love them. But even if you're married and you're tied to them in that way, you still have no excuse to let them interfere with what God has called you to do. No, there's never going to be this. You're never going to get in front of God and say, my husband, my wife, my kids, my boss. It's not going to work. There is no excuse. We have to do, we have to focus. And our focus will feed our faith or it will confirm our fears. So purposely seek God's wisdom and uh, he'll download the specific timetables, goals, objectives, resources to your mind to achieve whatever you have asked him to help you achieve in your life. And there's so many people out there, saints, that are not even as spiritual as you are, but nevertheless, they've tapped into something that's great. They're living lives beyond your imagination. I went to Cabo. I paid for a boat ticket. When I got there, there are people with multi-million dollar boats parked there. And they were not just there for a couple of days rushing back. They were there for months and just chilling on their yachts. Helicopters on the back of the yacht. That they are enjoying their life. Why is their life different than my life? Because the devil's fighting me. You can believe that all you want. The devil's not fighting. The devil has nothing to do with how God blesses you. If he wants to give you a yacht, he can give you a yacht. If he wants to give you a mansion, he can give you a mansion. It's your life. It's what you believe. It's the, what's the faith you give him of what you allow him to materialize in your life that makes the difference. So, whether by accident or providence, these people's lives are living, they're beyond your wildest logical understanding. But they tapped into something. They tapped into something great. And I believe that what they tapped into was faith. Whether it's the scientific community who has faith in nothing, or whether it's a Christian who has faith in God, faith is very real. Faith has a place in the universe. And all discoveries, all realities, stem from faith. You have to just know who do you place your, who are you acknowledging, and let God do the rest of it. Mark chapter 9, 23. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe. Job, I'm going to finish with this thought right here. But words carry great power. Before I read it, words carry out a lot of power. And the scriptures fulfill is full of principles, rather, that support the power of the tongue. Listen to this, Job chapter 22-28. This is Eliphaz, the, the Timonite, who was saying it, and he was actually wrong in what he was saying it because he was accusing Job of things that Job wasn't guilty of. Yet, what he was saying is still true. And this is what Eliphaz says, uh, Job 22-28. You will also declare a thing, and it will be established for you, so that light will shine on your ways. In other words, you'll say something, you'll speak something, and it's going to happen. And it's going to happen, and God's going to shine the light on it. And what you 
said with the right light hitting it, materializes and becomes real not only in your life but in everyone else's life who sees you. And it's just as real as it was before. It's always been there. Your success has always been there. Your sobriety has always been there. Your, you not being dependent on certain things and chemicals has always been there. You just have to be, believe that it can happen. You've got to believe that God can give you and make you something greater than you initially came into the slight of being. Some people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. That has nothing to do with how, how each of us will end up. Amen. We all have a choice to make. And faith, what's all the fuss about faith? If you guys have faith, it's worth, it's more, it's worth more than it's weight in gold. Faith is one of the most rarest, most precious commodities on planet Earth. And it can only be produced out of the heart. True faith now, the kind of faith that, that's great, can only be produced by the heart of a man or woman that acknowledges God. And it will take you from here to there. And God is going to give the Lord a hand.